This is the Distinctly Detroit Podcast, the only pod that explores why one wants to be in the D. I am your host, Fiota Ship III, the director of the University of Michigan Detroit Center. Join me as I interview students, scholars, leaders, and innovators about living, working, and loving in Detroit. Welcome back to the Distinctly Detroit podcast. Our next guest has 20 years of experience in community organizing, project management, educational innovation, as well as creating and implementing community initiatives. He has also worked as the National Community Development Institute Community Liaison for the Skillman Foundation's Good Neighborhoods Initiative. He is also a guest lecturer for Davenport University School, Davenport University School of Urban Education and U of M School of Social Work. He is currently the Chief Connections Officer for Compelling Connections, LLC. The DDP welcomes Lamont Cole. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank Appreciate you, you coming in today. Appreciate you having me back home. All right. Now, where are you from originally? Six Mile. Six Mile. <laughs> no, I am, I am a West Sider, West Side Detroit slash North Ender of Detroit, which this is part of my neighborhood. You know, you understand that when you have parents in two separate neighborhoods, that you, you kind of can- claim both. You get to claim both, man. So okay. I always love my North End. Matter of fact, uh, as we were in this in this building, we referred to it as a TAC, the UM, U of M TAC. My offices were right down the street in the North End Central Woodward community. Okay. So I'm home. I'm all oh, the way home. Cool. Where'd you go to high school? Detroit Refer High School. Okay. Detroit, right. Well, technically, I went to Cass Cooley and Refford. So, shout out to all of my matriculations for misunderstanding my uh, zeal <laughs> and over hyperness and willing to fight. All right. <laughs> well, then there's that. Uh, and where'd you do your undergrad at? Wayne State University. Again, right down the street, man. So, I'm all right here. Okay. I'm all right here. All right. And, and while you were undergrad, you um, pledged the fraternity? Yep. So I am a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. I started out uh, as an interest there at school, but I had to, I had children while I was in undergrad. Okay. And so with that, I had to make a decision. Was I, was I going to go ahead and finish this process or was I going to attempt to be a good dad slash work at Blockbuster Video <laughs> and be a father and try to get out of school? Obviously, I did not do any of them very well. So I had to stop my pledge process or my intake process at that time. Uh, work at Blockbuster, go to school, and be a father to twins. Oh, cool. So ultimately, I did finish that process. As soon as, literally, I finished in December, and I went back and joined the fraternity and finished my process that following January. So okay. I, I didn't let any grass grow under my feet. It was a, it was a great a great honor for me to become a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated as well. But funny, fun fact, I had just joined the Prince Hall Masons even two years before that happened as a family tradition while I was at Wayne State. So I kind of did things, as they would say, reverse. Okay. So how did joining uh, these fraternal organizations contribute to your development and right, your professional development as well as personal development? Uh, Absolutely. Great question. So as far as the Prince Hall body, uh, Prince Hall Masons being an older organization, I grew up as a part of the youth of the organization and then matriculated directly in. It matured me at much faster and made me have a perspective of what the seniors may have wanted and needed because ordinarily the average 19 year old is not hanging with a 56 year old or a 70 year old and listening to them on a daily, daily basis. So being a part of that organization very young gave me a different perspective and lens to see society through and then to understand that that breakdown between depression era babies, baby boomers, and I as a Gen X and our just our philosophical differences. But it it actually informed my work now because I lead a program called Senior University uh, and uh, Technology Labs, which is part of the Cody Rouge Community Action Alliance. There, we teach senior citizens the fundamentals of technology. So being able to bridge that gap directly and not have any awkwardness in dealing with the seniors, that truly prepared me for now. You never know what you do in the past and how it's going to affect you in your present. Yeah. And so that 
gave me that fundamental understanding because not only are my parents or were my parents much older uh, when I popped along as a, as they call a Messiah child, but uh, being around that demographic helped me right now, present day at this very moment, because I can interact with our seniors and not maybe understand in totality what they think or how they feel, but being able to at least empathize and understand. So when they when they feel awkward about computers or about learning how to do it, I'm able to ease that calm. So. Okay. And so tell us about your role with the uh, Good Good Neighborhoods program. I know that was a while ago, but it's building up some. Oh, yeah. So absolutely. So again, as I was saying, that what happens back then affects even like right now. I interviewed for the community liaison position for the Cody Rouge community because I lived right next door in Brightmoor. I lived at Telegraph and Grand River. Shout out to everybody in Brightmoor. Hey, y'all. Um, and there was a young lady who was interviewing for the position too. Ironically, or by fate, it was, um, she was candidate 29, I was candidate 30. And we sat and went around the chairs to interview for this position for community liaison. And we actually built a friendship in that hour and 30 minutes we were sitting in the chairs. Fast forward, her name is Kenyatta. Now, Kenyatta Campbell, she was Kenyatta Peoples then. She ended up getting the position as community liaison in Cody Rouge. And they put me in the North End because of all of my experience, my family ties. And first school I taught at was Sherrard, which was actually also in the North End. So I'm, I'm more than familiar with the community. And her and I literally started together uh, with, with uh, Natural Community Development Institute out of Oakland, California, which was partnered here in Detroit with Skillman Foundation uh, under the leadership of Carol Goss, Tanya Allen, Ed Ignatius, uh, Robert Thornton. I mean, every everybody, uh, oh my God, my program officer, Sharnita, I can't forget Sharnita. Uh, so that was the Skillman team and the NCD, NCDI team. What our goal was, was to really bridge the gap between the philanthropic community and the neighborhood community and the blocks, et cetera. Um, God bless you. One of the things that um, we were able to do was close the, the divide within four years. Social work, practice, and theory would say it takes 10 years to see systemic change in any community, be it a block, a street, neighborhood, community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we were able to begin to close that and to actually see systemic change within four years, thus making the Good Neighborhoods Initiative model uh, cutting edge at that time from 2006 to 2011, roughly. And so the work, one, barely yet, two steps back. The team that they assembled of, again, myself and Kenyatta, likewise, Adisa Cheney, uh, Maria, Salinas, Maria Salinas in Southwest Detroit, Quincy Jones over in the Osborne community. Literally, they called us the superpowers because we all had experience and a base in those communities. And that really helped glue things together a lot faster to see change. So the work, the work was powerful. Uh, it led to a lot of uh, post work in other cities and states for me as a consultant later on. Mm -hmm. um, and it really became career building and it validated each of us in our own respects. For me, uh, being undergrad academic understood, everyone else was professional degree and understood. But for me, being able to be extremely successful in this, it validated what we now know as my multiple intelligence. A uh, shout out to Dr. Howard Gardner, Harvard University, back in 83 when he came out with this whole idea, how are you smart? And it took all the way to an adulthood for me to figure out how I was smart. This initiative helped validate that. And so how did this initiative, how did that initiative prepare you for your current role? So it was a relationship. It's all about relationships. It is about who you know. Uh, do not be uh, alert to believe that not having relationships um, will take you far. Uh, 
The Cody Rich Community Action Alliance is led by Ms. Kenyatta Campbell, who was my who was then my colleague and my peer. And her understanding and knowing how I work and what expectations she could get out of me, what things that she expected out of me, rather. She uh, called me one day, literally like, hey, you back home from Grand Rapids? I said, absolutely. And she says, hey, uh, I need you to lead this computer program. Uh, I'll just send you the, the grant information on it, and I need you to make it happen. Back then, uh, in the early 2000s or mid-2000s, when we were working together, I kind of dabbled in program creation. Okay. And with that, uh, she said, hey, I need you to create this program. Uh, it's going to be for senior citizens. It's going to be in this community, 48228. Um, we have a substantial grant from the government, and they want us to supply computers, but we also want to teach technology to them. I said, hey, no problem. Let me get there. So that relationship, her understanding already what I could do and my abilities, uh, it made it sweet. She said, hey, this is what I want. Make it happen. Got behind my computer, started doing some research. Uh, two weeks later, sent her over a proposed uh, a proposed uh, curricula, and you know she kind of altered some things that she really wanted to see for the seniors and how I did it, and we were on the road going. And so even right now, we still offer classes for seniors over at Detroit Impact, over at 9930 Greenfield Road. That's not a shameless plug. I'm just saying in case you're ever wondering. Uh, as we have a tech hub there, so both giving advice. And then on Tuesdays and Saturdays, we're actually doing classes for seniors. And again, it's the fundamentals, right? How often have you seen or heard or know a senior citizen that have said to their child or to their grandchild, uh, help me with this phone. How you turn this thing on? <laughs> What's this, this computer? How you turn this thing on? So we do the fundamentals. We don't dive deep into Word and all that stuff. How do you turn? Literally, first class is how do I turn this damn thing on? First yeah. class. And so really kind of diving into their needs so we can restore some of their individuality where they don't have to always ask and bring them into a time period that some of them quite truthfully didn't want to be a part of. Oh, yeah, that's true. So you've done a lot of extensive community engagement over the years and throughout your career. Yes. What are some of the challenges you run into uh, doing community engagement? So you're only as good as your last job, right? So for me, one of the biggest snares, I will say, and this is recently, as in the last three years, aside from COVID, having worked uh, in a very conservative atmosphere in a highly political time and not shying away from this is the work that I have done, um, when I returned to Detroit, some people were kind of hands off on me, believing that since I worked in a very potentially conservative atmosphere and sect of society that I had became one of them, however you want to frame that. And being in a city like Detroit, being one of them at times is not a good look, depending on how your politics roll. So the community then began to look at me in some cases as not the kid from Six Mile, not the kid from North End or Brightmore or any of that. I had in essentially became one of whatever the them is of society. I became one of them because I worked in conservatism so long. So when I came back, people were hands off, like legit, like you still one of them. And I'm saying them again, because it's not necessarily a culture of people as much as it may be a political favor of people. Yeah. And so, um, Next thing you know, as I'm looking for new employment, new jobs, and new uh, contracts, et cetera, people, for one of the first questions is, are you still tied to them? And so that became a blockage or a barrier for me in my professional life. Uh, Kenyatta and folks who already have known me yeah. and who know that, you know, just because I work for a particular group doesn't mean, or a contractor to a particular group does not mean that you share their views. I share their views, values, or yeah. anything. Just like anyone who works for this, who worked for the state of Michigan during the time that it may have been conservative, uh, a conservative uh, government, you worked for them too. Yeah. So, I mean, if if that is indeed the case, why not glean what I have learned? versus what, who you perceive me to be. And I, and I said 
candidly, and I will still say candidly, uh, that last, those eight years that I spent in that atmosphere taught me so much more because I grew up in a very liberal, uh, a very, very liberal sect of society. Yeah. And so under, now having a greater understanding to how others do it, now I'm, I have now come full circle. So based on your political agenda, your religious value, your economic stance, your cultural or racial makeup, or, nat or nationality, I have a greater understanding of the entire gambit versus just being black, being from Detroit, being from Six Mile or North End. So, um, kind of Again, going full circle. Perspective over there. Yeah. Learned oh, a lot. Man, perspective. So they do things differently on the other side of the state. So, yeah. Bro. That had to be a good thing. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I honestly would never change that, uh, that stance because all learning, in some cases, be it something you don't think is good, or something that is good. All learning is good because now you know more than you hitherto have done. You did not know this beforehand, but now you do. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of learning, you've uh, gone on to become a guest lecturer at m many universities in the area. What's that experience like, and what are you lecturing on? Man, that's fun. It's fun. I, I, and so I'm not, the, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but if I'm hot, I can cut butter. Mm -hmm. So here's what I do. Here's what I did, actually. Created a curriculum um, based on practitioner knowledge. So rock with me on this. Social workers studies Maslow's hierarchy of need when it comes to uh, trying to reach children, right? You yeah. must be fed, must feel secure, must be clothed. All these values that is that are needed before a child can actually learn. Key term, learn. Teachers are taught, boom, uh, theory, which is more of a, is more about pedagogy and about the academia and about how to teach, right? No one's ever thought to cross pollinate those two ideas. If you teach teachers Maslow's and teach social workers Booms, now they have a better understanding of how the other works and they both can affect society a little bit differently. Because if a teacher understands that Marquez comes into the classroom and is acting a fool at 7.30 in the morning, you must first find out if he's hungry. What's going on with him? What happened last night? Oh, daddy came home Wednesday. Mama disappeared last night. He the man of the house. So, you, so teachers are not necessarily trained to catch those communal or societal norms. That is actually normal. Not, well, it's not normal, but it's normal in the inner city and even in suburbia, right? It looks different for every single case. So that's how we attack or we move towards the education and dealing with Davenport. Likewise, a lot of our uh, work that um, myself and Professor Sarah Brooks, hey Sarah, shout out to you out there in California. She's at Stanford now, uh, working at Stanford. A lot of our work, we did advocacy work um, in Grand Rapids area around education because the red tape of education is so thick that trying to tear through it, being internal to it, you can't do it. So it's much easier to have a third party kind of help you because one, you can't violate FERPA. Two, uh, you don't want to lose your job from from uh, maybe going against the grain of the school to help a child. So with that being said, and I'm going all the way back into the Davenport when I'm when I'm lecturing in, we have created case studies. We've done well over 250 cases in Grand Rapids around uh, education and, uh, and around um, various needs and advocacy for, for children and families. So what we did is we took those cases and actually created case studies for them. Dr. Andre Perry, uh, shout out to the doc out there uh, somewhere, Pennsylvania or wherever he's at now, he created the Graduate School of Education for Davenport University. Okay. So uh, he and I being in Grand Rapids and being Midwesterners, we were just sitting there talking one day and I was telling him about some of the cases and he was like, man, that's so wild. That would be a dope class for this graduate program. And I was like, and he turned, and we turned, it's like the light bulb came on for both of us simultaneously. Mm -hmm. He was like, can I get some of those case studies? I was like, can I lecture those case studies? And so, uh, he literally, eight years ago, wrote Professor Brooks and myself 
into the uh, into the uh, urban education graduate school program before they even rolled out the school. And so we have been a permanent fixture in that program there uh, at Davenport University based on our work in education. The social work aspect of things at the University of Michigan School of Social Work, I work with uh, Professor um, Adisa Cheney. He and I worked with Good Neighborhoods together. He was over in the Chelsea Condon. Um, Professor Katrina Shanks and yeah. everyone at that school was like, that's actually kind of a cool idea to have to bring them back, my meaning uh the liaisons yeah. that we were. I've been trying to get Katrina on this show for ages. One Answer day. the phone, Dr. Shanks. That's a call. That's a call. <laughs> but uh, to get it to bring everyone forward and to bring some practitioner insight, yeah. we don't buck theory, not at all. But in every neighborhood, matter of fact, let me quote Ed Ignatius from the Skillman Foundation. Ed said, when you seen one good neighborhood, you have seen one good neighborhood. Poverty is a very intimate thing. It never looks the same from a block to a street to a neighborhood to a community. Poverty looks different in every house. And that was one of the things that we caught early in the Good Neighborhoods Initiative. No two houses on the same street was the same. And when you looked at poverty, poverty strikes people differently. As much as everyone wants to put in a cookie cutter whole mold, yeah. it looks different. So your outcomes would never be the same from the west side to the east side, east six mile to east seven mile. It looks different. So with 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 that with that backdrop, um, we do some of the practitioner uh, push in work that is maybe sometimes bucking some of the theory of change. Some of our work actually kind of bucks it. So it's better for me to be a lecturer and come in and say, these were outcomes that we had in this particular idea, or this, these are the notions we had because of this. And it may you know, go against, but being a lecturer, we could do that because we're not uh, handcuffed to a direct, direct curricula from the institution. So that's the push in we do every so often for uh, U of M School of Social Work, or at least myself. And ironically, as you ask, you're asking questions about fraternity and that life, that is actually uh, a very small smidgen of one of the courses that I lecture. They ask, how does all that you know, work with this? And one of the things that I was taught early is like, there's no such thing as having too many connections you need those things because that is how you identify with each house, each family, each person in the neighborhood. So that's how all that stuff kind of came to be. So, okay. So you're out doing lectures. You're now working uh, with senior citizens in the community. What do you, um, what's next for you? I mean, what's coming up? What's, uh, you know, what's in your future? So, I am uh, prospectively looking at doing some work um, over in the east side. So part of the whole nonprofit slash good neighborhoods and nonprofit work that we did, a lot of it focused on education and community change. Yeah. Community change is also a physical look, right? So the big term everyone's using now is gentrification, like gentrifying communities. They're saying Detroit's being more gentrified. Yeah. I can tell people straight up and down, sometimes you induce these things upon yourself because when people tell you, hey, I know your taxes are going up, I know this is happening, but sit on this, stay on this because there's development coming and you have this 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 mindset, um, uh, adverse mindset to growth mindset, you're thinking like, no, this neighborhood's never going to be okay, I'm going to get out right now. And even and this is not a slap at my at my North End family, but I've told folks sit on that because this change is coming. So to answer your question directly, I'm looking at doing more uh, systemic practice in the neighborhoods, like kind of letting them know, hey, as your neighborhood is being developed, this is how you become a part of and not pushed out from, right? So doing mm -hmm. a lot more community development as they as they develop Herman Kiefer uh, over in the uh, Connor. Uh, Jefferson area. I'm looking to do some consulting work there. Uh, essentially being a consultant with my wide uh, platform. Uh, so the, besides being named the chief connections officer, 
Uh, some others na- uh, nickname me the higher gun. They point to a problem and they tell me to shoot at it. Okay. So that's what I do. And that's what I love to do. I love being uh, a consultant because no two days will look alike. No two issues will be alike. And I can honestly, in my heart, say I'm being compensated to help and assist the city, the dirt that I came from, to grow into a rich soil and richer communities. And that as buildings are going up, I can see more community people going into them and being a part of them. Conversations with communities are key if you're a developer because you should not just go into a neighborhood and start knocking down buildings or enhancing or doing anything else if you don't have community buy-in. In order to build community, you have to be community. And if you really, really, really want that community to thrive and to look the same and become enhanced with new people and to have that community culture, you must take time to do that. So my information is somewhere on here. If you're interested, let me know. Oh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to all of that. <laughs> that was my shameless uh, plug, right? Yeah. But, uh, and yeah, one more question. It's Absolutely. Just, yeah, it was mentioned earlier. You're mentioned, you are, um, you're a Mason and you're a Sigma. How does how does your relationship with these fraternal organizations uh, shape your community engagement? And also, what role do these organizations have in community development? Uh, so there's in the in the fraternal world when you're active in more than one organization. Uh, I've heard some folks say you can only serve you only can serve one master, and I'm like, that's good. I serve one in my in my life. It's Jesus Christ. And so my fraternal bodies have nothing to do with serving as a master, but being both of them bring me different community uh, prowess and abilities to navigate. Um, professionally, when I uh, interact with those and other corporate sects and things like that, being a member of a historically black university, excuse me, historically black uh, fraternity, it allows me just a leg up in order to get into certain doors and to be able to make that that contact. Likewise, um, within the Masons, within Prince Hall Masonry in Michigan, um, not only do I serve in our state leadership or jurisdictional leadership, uh, I serve within the community over at the Gresham and McDougal area, whether we're doing something with schools and things like that. Facial recognition and name recognition within the black community are very big deals. That's why a lot of people get elected just based on the fact that I know that young man or uh, they have a name that everyone recognizes. Uh, Eddie Murphy poked fun at it at, uh, in a movie, Distinguished Gentleman, a yeah. long time ago, yep. just saying like, hey, I know that name. So my name being in all of these different circles and sects of society, I mean, whether it's a vagrant sipping out of a paper bag or, the, or dining at the table with the queen, my name is there and all in between. So those two organizations, especially with Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated being a fraternity of the people, I mean, we start thinking about uh, John R. Lewis, right? So a rights activist. But then you also got Huey Percy Newton, Sigma men. So being able to also glean from their personalities and from what they did, that also helps me in the community. So think, I mean, from the radicalness or the quote unquote radicalness of Huey Newton to that of the sturdiness, the consistency, the drive and zeal of John Robert Lewis. Come on, man. So learning from my history of both organizations and ability, uh, that really helps inform my work because I look at past members of both and say, okay, I'm going to take this from them because I need to take what was in the past to move forward in the future. Okay. So what advice do you have for aspiring community leaders or community organizers? Mm. Find your voice and never be ashamed of it. Find your intelligence and let it work for you. Um, you came out of cast in 91. I'm sure your parents told you find a job, do something and be good at one thing, right? Or at least our generation. Yeah. Uh, what this generation, be it, Millennials, Gen Z, et cetera, one thing that they have done is they don't allow their voice to just be one. 
they allowed their voice to speak to multitudes of things, right? Uh, what our parents didn't realize is they could work. They worked at the factory. Some of them repaired cars at night. Some of them actually, like my mother worked at Dodge truck. Then she did catering, but she always let me get one job. Not realizing herself, she had two, three jobs. Yeah. This generation is not waiting to be told to do one thing. They're doing everything possible. So my my words to this to this generation. Do everything. Do everything that you think you can and things that you're scared to do. Do it. Do it. Your multiple intelligence is given to you by God, whether you call call it God or call it energy or call it the vibe, is given to you. You have 10 digits potentially on your fingers. 10 digits. There are 7 billion people on earth. If you could get 10 individual digits with different fingerprints, why can't you have a different intelligence? Why, why, why? You're taught that you have one. That's not true. Whatever God gave you is what, they, what he gave you. Do everything and find your voice and let your voice be loud and bold and never apologize for your greatness. All right. But now we're going to transition to what we call our lightning round. All right, let's roll. Okay. We're going to ask you a series of questions kind of about your activity in Detroit. And the first question is, what is your Coney order? Oh, uh, grilled chicken salad, no onions, no pepperoncino, sauce and island dressing. <laughs> okay. Fries with some seasoned salt on them and uh, Coke Zero, cherry if possible. Oh, boy. Coke Zero. Okay. <laughs> uh, better made or Lay's? Better made, Bro, Sal Supriano. Salvador Supriano on the back of the bag. Yes. Okay. All day. Barbecue. <laughs> Fago or Verner's? Mm, that might be the hardest question you ask today. Uh, okay, I got to say Fago because, you know, that red pop and that great pop, man. Okay. Pop, not soda. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely pop. Favorite place to go in the city? For visuals or for to, to chill, relax? Favorite place to go in the city? Uh, to cigar bar over on second, birds on second to have a cigar. One because it's in the north end. Two, I like cigars, and it's just it's a communal space, man. It's like I can remember what it was thirty years ago versus it being this wonderful place for brothers to come together and sisters. Uh, child smoking with my pearls, the puffing of my pearls, the cigar ladies group. Uh, sitting outside on the, in the north end having cigars. Can't beat it. Likewise, I do hit La Casa downtown if because I live closer to it. And honestly, just walking up and down Woodward. Okay. Loving it. Okay. Um, favorite Detroit athlete? Oh, Rick Mahorn. Oh, boy. Okay. Rick Mahorn School of Basketball. If you've never played it, uh, that's old school. Yeah, <laughs> You know what I'm talking okay. about. Elbow to the rear. Okay. Favorite <laughs> Motown artist? Ooh, we have some great ones. I want to say Smokey because he wrote for everybody, but uh, I am try and true a Mr. David Ruffins fan to this day. Walk away from love and everything, but you, I got to give Mr. Smokey Robinson his just due because he wrote most of the songs. So okay. And our last question is: Where can we find you? You can find me. Uh, my email is compelling connections LLC at gmail dot com. Uh, and honestly. If you just say my name in the city, somebody's going to know me. It's That's not an arrogant thing. By the way, they say uh, white men are knowledgeable, black men are arrogant when you know something. So I, I kind of buck that system too. Mm -hmm. I'm knowledgeable. So uh, if you if, guarantee you, you'll find me. Also, I attend Fellowship Chapel Church under the leadership of Dr. Wendell Anthony. And I'm typically at church too. But email me. Uh, likewise, you can reach me in the Cody Rouge community right now. Uh, working with the Senior University, uh, 9930 Greenfield Road. Matter of fact, we're having an open house on Monday at the office at 12 noon. Uh, come by if you have computer questions or if you have communal questions. How do we do this in the community? My office is there and is always open. So please stop through. And if you say, what up, though, you'll get the same greetings you'll get if you say hello. <laughs> All right. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Lamont Cole, thank you for coming yeah, on. We thank really you for having me. You. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Okay. And this has been the Distinctly Detroit podcast. You can get us anywhere you get your pods. Uh, please like, rate, subscribe, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. This has been the Distinctly Detroit podcast. This is a production of the University of Michigan Detroit Center. 
You can find us anywhere you get your pods. Please like, subscribe, and rate us. This podcast is executive produced by Marlon Franklin, edited by Ranza Stanton, and written by Shaylin Jones and Fiota Ship III.